Hey, hi, hello, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Jess and I know you're here for the mess. <laughs> Bars. Okay, no, for, for real. <laughs> welcome to another installment of Book Community where I try and fail to keep you abreast on the goings on in the bookish community. But how can you sip the tea if you ain't got nothing to eat? So thank you to our sponsor, Green Chef. Yes, thank you to Green Chef for sponsoring today's video. Green Chef is a CCOF certified organic company and they have options for every lifestyle, keto, paleo, vegan, vegetarian, fast and fit, Mediterranean, and gluten-free. Um, again, this arrived at the perfect time on a Thursday when I was tired of cooking and was low on groceries. And this is just one of the amazing reasons Green Chef, I love Green Chef because doorstep delivery allows you to skip the grocery store while pre-portioned ingredients and pre-made sauces make cooking a snap on busy weeknights. Green Chef makes cooking so easy. You can spend less time stressing and more time enjoying delicious home-cooked meals. <laughs> Amen. They have organic protein and wild-cut seafood options. There are delicious choices for breakfast, lunch, and dinner that fit your health lifestyle. Hallelujah. And they have a new protein packed meal preference, which I tried this time. A new collection of recipes fit for high protein dietary preferences with menu items, each containing an average of 40 grams of protein per serving. So uh, this meal I made, it was just for me. It was made for two, so I had leftovers, which was perfect. And it doesn't take a lot of time. You chop up all the things. Of course, there's step-by-step -step ingredients with photos <laughs> that walk you through the preparation, which I need. So listen up. For a limited time, Green Chef will plant one tree for every box sold with the organization One Tree Planted in honor of Earth Month. Use my code JessOwens60 to get 60% off and free shipping on your first box. Go to greenchef.com for more details. That is an amazing offer and helping to save the planet. So thanks again to Green Chef for sponsoring today's video. I might have to hop off here anytime. I first have to show you my shirt. <laughs> If you, <laughs> if you're on this part of TikTok, then you know. Point of order. I love it. Eric Mays for president. Anyway, so um, lots of things have been accumulating, and uh, I always, as always, I'm never going to be able to get to everything. And then, um, yeah. So if there's something important. Um, that you think I missed or should be discussed, leave it in the comments. Always keep it cute and respectful in the comments. Pretty please, thank you. But I wanted to start with Bonobles. Now, if you don't know what Bonobles is, yes you do, it's Barnes & Noble, which is our largest um, book chain in the United States. Largest one that's like a chain, obviously not indie. But this article is interesting. So the dude who owns Barnes & Noble, it was bought by James Gaunt, who owns, does he own Waterstones? He owns something in the UK. The article title is what really grabbed me because it said Amazon doesn't care about books, how Barnes and Noble bounced back. And it's like, whatever, Amazon doesn't care about books. But so the article he's talking about how Barnes and Noble has been changing. So if you've ever been in a Barnes and Noble, they're usually huge stores, they have books, but they have games, they have Funko Pops, they have magazines, records, like a whole lot of stuff. But he's saying that now that is changing, so you're not gonna see much beyond books, Daunt, says Daunt, Barnes & Noble's British chief executive. Um, I mean, there are other things, but it's unequivocally book driven. But each of the chains, approximately 600 stores, is meant to operate like an independent bookstore, unique and highly curated to fit a local community. The aim is to offer something completely different from Amazon, where about half of all print books sold in the US are bought. Amazon doesn't care about books. A book is just another thing in the warehouse. Whereas bookstores are places of discovery. They're just really nice spaces. And so why I love this idea, and I have not been to even a quarter of the Barnes and Nobles in the country. I wonder if y'all have recently been to one. I've been to one mine here. Granted, I've only been there maybe twice. So I can't say if it's a huge change from how it used to be. It still had all that extra stuff in it. And so for the big stores that already have that, I don't know if they're taking that out. I don't know what they would do with that space. Are they gonna put more books in there? And then are they building any new ones? I'm assuming that they're talking about their the stores that already exist. So maybe they're doing renovations, I don't know. But yes, I love this idea of making it feel like an indie, but it's not an indie, right? 
like you have people employed there but no one I don't know I don't know how the franchise works I feel like yes there's money going back into that local community but not as much as if it was an indie bookstore and then as we have seen in the last year Barnes and Noble's Barnes and Noble's Barnes and Noble's interesting practices on what they're going to put on the shelves and not giving um middle grade and young adult um what do you call them debut authors the shelf space so the time to shine how much space they dedicate to white authors and books that have been popular forever like you go to a barnes noble and there's just shelves of books of lord of the rings we do not still need that and there's whole shelf of sarah j mass and a whole table of sarah j mass and then a book talk table with sarah j mass on it it's just like mm. So I would be interested, I really brought this here to get y'all's feedback of how you feel your local Barnes & Noble, has it been changing? Um, and have you noticed those things? And is it positive? Like, has it gotten better? Because he's making this seem like it's gonna be amazing and that every store is really gonna be different to reflect the community that they're in, which would be great. But also, who are the people managing the stores? And what are they like, what's, what's the, what are they doing to make them feel? more like are you taking population statistics of your area and changing the books based on that i doubt it like are you just like hanging up local sports flags or something or the state flag and you're like woo that local like are you really looking do you are there a lot of like children like is your children's section bigger because there's a lot of children in this community in this part of the town um a lot of co like i want to know what those are doing but so it talks about him and his past and blah 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 but talking about how they've closed all these stores and all the changes that he made to stay in the game he says booksellers and stores largely need autonomy to run their shop best soon after he arrived he dramatically reduced the size of the company's corporate staff which used to have several offices in manhattan and i agree but are the booksellers the people who are in the stores every day who are seeing what books get sold who are seeing what kind of people come in are they the ones who get to offer suggestions for these changes because i bet you they're not so anyway um i'm not like it says he puts his he tries to put himself in the shoes of the store manager and ask him what he would want from a corporate office and it said to be left alone to do the book selling part i want someone to change my light bulbs i want somebody to fix my escalator i want somebody to spend money when i need it to pay rent as and as well as you possibly can for rages wages and let me get on with it well you know i've known i've known a few people who worked at barnes and noble and i don't know if the wages part is is there yet so anyway i don't know this is a recent article i think it was yeah it was this weekend so maybe if you do go to barnes noble regularly or even quarterly maybe over the next year try to keep take note when you go in and see if anything's really changing and i know some people visit their barnes noble very often and they you know know the staff and i i wonder i wonder what they think i might ask the next time i go but anyway i just thought that was interesting but let's keep it pushing because there are things to talk about so i had seen this a while ago and it said something that roald dahl who is an author of like matilda and the bfg and the witches you know james and the giant peach all these all these things um apparently they are wanting to change his books to make them like more acceptable like change some of the language and if you've read them you know I, they're children's books so they have been rewritten puffin has hired sensitivity readers to rewrite chunks of the author's text to make sure the books can continue to be enjoyed by all today and so some of them are like augustus gloop in charlie and the chocolate factory is now described as enormous in uh twits mrs twit is no longer ugly and beastly but just beastly uh let's see they've taken out a lot of uses of the word fat um the word ugly so another one is in james and the giant peach the centipede sings on sponge was ter terrifically fat and tremendously flabby at that on spiker was thin as a wire and dry as a bone only drier so now they've changed it to Aunt Sponge was a nasty old brute and deserved to be squashed by the fruit. Aunt Spiker was much of the same and deserves half of the blame. So there's gender neutral terms that have been added. Instead of Oompa Loompas being small men, they're now small people. 
Um, and so the co-founder of Inclusive Minds, who this must be, who's changing this, aim to ensure authentic representation by working closely with the book world and with those who have lived experience in any facet of diversity. Now, I... Obviously, we don't want those things in our books now, but I just... What are your thoughts? Because I don't know. I just... I don't think it should be changed because it's like, where... If you start there, where does it end? What will be next? You know, like, and that's that's just the text. You can read something old and be like, mm, yeah, this doesn't this doesn't hold up well, or ooh, you're seeing it through a different lens now in 2023, which is to be expected when these were published. I don't know how long ago. You're like, yeah, that's you know, maybe you cringe at that word or something, but I, I don't, I don't know if I agree with them being changed, and I, I want to know your perspective. And I was reminded of this again because there was a tweet um about judy bloom and um, an opinion that she had so there was an article in variety and they asked on uh her thoughts on royal dolls being books being rewritten and she said i think if royal doll was around you would be hearing what he thinks about that whatever it is whatever he's accused of being there's a lot of truth there but the books are the books kids still love the books and they love them the way he wrote them so i don't believe in that exactly like you can critique and criticize those all day i mean like how many you pick up a classic and you're like whoa reading it with a present day lens you're obviously gonna have but different thoughts and feelings about it and you're it's not going to be it was not written in the same time as now so obviously things are gonna be different but yeah 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 but also additionally uh she also expressed her support of gender queer which is a book that continuously is being challenged and banned in so many states and school districts around the united states because people are stupid but judy bloom posted i wholly support the trans community my point which was taken out of context is that i can empathize with the writer or person who has been harassed online I stand with the trans community and vehemently disagree with anyone who does not fully support equality and acceptance for LGBTQIA plus people. Anything to the contrary is total bullshit. I don't know what she was saying or what people misconstrued from what she said. So I was Googling and it said that Judy Bloom was talking about JKR being a victim of Twitter uh, and about online abuse. Um, talking about what she talks about obviously she's saying I don't support what she supports I don't agree with that I support the queer community 100% but that she understands or is trying to empathize you know that uh, getting verbally abused online could be a lot a recent interview with Variety and so in the article, it says, what are you protecting your children from? That's what Bloom said. Protecting your children means educating them and arming them with knowledge and reading and supporting what they want to read. No child is going to become transgender or gay or lesbian because they read a book. It's not going to happen. They may say, oh, this is just like me. This is what I'm feeling and thinking about. Or I'm interested in this because I have friends who may be gay, bi, lesbian. They want to know. I just read a book that was wonderfully enlightening to me. It's called Gender Queer. A memoir by Maya Kobabi is probably the number one banned book in America right now. And I thought this young person is telling me how they came to be what they are today. And I learned a lot and became even more. That's what books are all about. Um, but she clarified what she meant. She said she said what she said. Then I saw something on my timeline that was like, I'm not surprised, but I am surprised. And this was Scholastic. So this author uh, had her book that yes had her book that she was publishing with scholastic and in her author's note they wanted her to change something that she did not want to change so she said no more subtweeting this is what happened full story at the link i'm so disappointed and furious and unsurprised but i also have receipts scholastic wanted to feature my book but only if i censored the word racism from the author's note so on the post, it says, recently I got an email with an offer from Scholastic's educational division to license Love in the Library for an AAN, um, AANHPI, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islanders, I believe, narratives collection. And so of course she was really excited and she said, I'm really, she's really proud of her book and the success and of her publisher. So 
she said she was happy Scholastic wanted to license her book but with a change to the author's note. My offer was contingent upon it. Without even looking I knew what it was going to be. It was going to be the paragraph that inspires one star reviews from angry patriots. The one that sends into my inbox with words unfit to repeat here or anywhere. And sure enough that was exactly what they wanted to remove but not only that the word racism, racism would be removed from the author's note altogether. So there's the image that I'll put on the screen of the part of the author's note and there's like the red lines through it. I'm like, did they really send this back to her? But it says, if I can try to read it, oof. as much as I would have hoped this would be a story of a distant past, it's not. It's very much the story of America here and now. The racism that put my grandparents into mini doka. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. It's the same hate that keeps children in cages on our border. It's the myth of white supremacy that brought slavery to our past and allows the police to murder black people in our present. It's the same fear that brings Muslim bans. It's the same contempt that creates voter suppression, medical apartheid, and food deserts. The same cruelty that carved reservations out of stolen sovereign land that paved the trail of tears. Hate is not a virus, it is an American tradition. Ooh! good hold on i'm about to buy this book i mean she told no lies but they wanted to take this book and repackage it so that it was just a simple love st story nothing more not anything that might offend those book banners and what they call this politically sensitive moment the irony of curating a collection tentatively titled rising voices amplifying aanhpi narratives with one hand while demanding that i strangle my own voice with the other was to me the perfect encapsulation of what publishing our dubious white ally does so often to marginalized creators they want the credibility of our identities, want to market our biographies. They want to sell our suffering, smoothed down and made palatable to the white readers they prioritize, to a sage white guilt with stories that promise to make them better people while never threatening them, not even with discomfort. They have no investment in our voices. Always our voices are the first sacrifice at the altar of marketability. And excuse my language, but absolutely the fuck not. Ah, you For a moment I wondered if there was a way to edit it so we could agree on it, but then I looked at the proposed edit. The one my offer was contingent upon again. The removal of the word racism made it all too clear. There was no compromise to be had here. There was no way to work with this. It was a Faustian bargain and I couldn't take it. And forgive my weakness, but I cried. For the opportunity I had just moments ago been so thrilled to receive gone just as fast for my resentment of being put in a position where I had to choose between my career and my ethics for all the other people just like me who are likely given these kinds of choices all the time but who for fear of losing future opportunities or for fear that this is their only opportunity or who simply cannot turn down money take the bargain for the pure frustration that only years of dealing with the same kind of bullshit over and over again can inspire for the fear that this kind of limitation will be what defines my career I cried and I felt ashamed that I was crying and furious that I've been made to cry by an industry that will never cry over me. Wow. Mm, she read them for Bill. And it is longer. I won't read it all here. I will link it down below though if you want to read it. But that is some bullshit. Are we surprised? No. But it just sometimes is jarring, I guess, when you see the quiet part out loud. When the stuff they try to keep behind closed doors is brought to the light. And I'm so glad that she shared that. Um, and they should be ashamed, embarrassed. And I don't wanna hear any apologies. You Like, you're obviously not listening and you damn sure ain't learning nothing. Like, oh my God. It just never ending. Is there hope that any of these corporations will ever learn anything? Why a white person is at the helm? Probably not. And if you got mad about that, check yourself. Don't check me. <sighs> okay. As if that's not terrible enough. In addition to all these books challenging, book challenges, bans, removal of books from schools. Here's another one in Missouri or misery. So Missouri House Republicans want to defund their libraries. So last year, as many other states did, they had, they came up with this bullshit ass list of books that they wanted to remove from libraries. Um, I think it was around 300 different titles. And so the ACLU filed a lawsuit against the state for that. And now they're like, well, let's just defund all the libraries. Um, so they voted to cut all funding for libraries in its version of the state's annual budget, an unprecedented move that has 
angered librarians and patrons across the state who rely on the facilities from everything from books to educational programming and internet access because libraries are more than books and I know it's like Jessica why are you yelling at me I'm just getting out my frustration and maybe if a random person comes across this video who isn't in this community they can fuel the anger and go down to their like local community board meeting or something and raise hell because this is fucking ridiculous even if libraries were just books still extremely important and foundational life-changing for communities but they are more than books librarians are more than people who just check out books and read books I so the proposal is not yet final it now sits before the state senate appropriations committee along with the rest of their annual 45.6 billion dollar budget uh, and republican chair blah 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 so there's 160 library districts and especially in rural areas where services are not as robust the threat feels real obviously the majority of missouri libraries are small libraries and for smaller communities that rely on this funding to serve their communities to provide summer reading programming to provide new books new materials books and to pay their staff this will have an absolutely devastating effect like i just would love to know all of those people in the missouri state house or whatever house representative whatever the fuck you want to call yourselves i would love to see your budget the money you spend from taxpayers money on whatever the fuck because we know it's not all work related i would love to see that you work about libraries you need to worry about your goddamn checking account bitch you need to worry about if your wife is gonna find out who you were sleeping with when you said you were working late and you weren't i'm so sick of this goddamn country i am so sick of it and it is infuriating to know that we cannot do anything i'll take that back there are certain things we can do and you can go to your city hall meetings you can go to these school board meetings and we can try to raise hell but we shouldn't have to be fighting this. This is just like saying you're gonna defund the post office. Excuse me, these are essentials. Are you gonna defund the fire department next? Things that our taxes go to? Our taxes don't go to much, good. This is one of them, because I know that tax money never goes to the roads, especially not around here, but you need to keep them goddamn libraries open and maybe if these people who love to vote on defunding libraries and restricting books actually read a fucking book that wasn't a memoir by what's his name what's that little pits bitch ass then maybe they would actually learn something and realize how vital libraries are but i'm asking too much from these closed-minded fucking oh, i was gonna call them okay anyway <sighs> okay so it's saying in Missouri, 20% of the population, so that's more than 1.26 million people, do not have high-speed internet access. Nearly 34% of their population live in rural parts of the state where this kind of access can be harder to come by. Libraries provide a lifeline to this, to this community, among others. Like, they have other, look, beyond internet, libraries have historically provided analog services that existed long before fiber optics such as passport services, free concerts, assisting with voter registration. Um, during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, some branches expanded their offerings to include distribution of masks and test kits and vaccine clinics and have movies. And you can, I just, ah, I literally just went to my library during my lunch break to print something off because I don't have a printer. But it's right down the street. So I paid my little 60 cents my six pages that I printed and while I was in there there was a library there was a person helping somebody I don't know if she was helping this lady do this thing because that's what they do they help people in the community <sighs> so I guess they also were saying that um we shouldn't subsidize attempts to overturn laws that we also created that's what they're saying in the budget meeting but ACLU said that the lawsuit that was filed in February was not funded by state funded library dollars so that money is not coming from there oh okay but you know all this law stuff you know laws i'm sure it's going to be challenged i hope regina cooper the executive director of the springville green county library district um and she has worked there for more than 40 years like money is tight we have a lot of needs as you know inflation continues to be a problem every year our expenses go up i think it makes community members feel like 
uh, feel like that who they elected don't really care about what their needs are because it's something they all know and use every day to suddenly have the legislator say no we're not going to provide any more money for you that's very disappointing I think disappointing is an understatement and you know it's probably because they're like oh well, I don't use a library my kids don't use library they got one at their school and I don't I have high speed internet these people can never see outside of their worldview and those are all the people, not all, those are a majority of the people in power are these selfish, non-empathetic, conservative, closed-minded bigots. So if you live in Missouri, I suggest you raise hell because this is unacceptable. And it's, they won't be the first ones. I, I'm, they're probably not the first ones. And they definitely wouldn't be the last. I don't want to even say I'm surprised such and such, but I don't even want to put it out there into the ether. We don't need any more of that. I am just, I, this also, this often falls into what really brings me down depression. We all know with mental illnesses, imbalances in our brains. Hello. I'm currently, I changed up my medication yet again because it is a freaking science experiment at this point. But there are things that obviously can help and can make it worse. And waking up every day and seeing the bullshit everywhere I look. Because let's, look, I can't stay off the internet, okay? I love it there. That's where my friends live. They live in the internet. They live in my phone. And just see day after day, some new law, some new thing proposed to restrict access, to take away rights to harm people, to do nothing in the face of all the other bullshit that's going on in our country, re pew pew violence. Let's, let's ignore that. That's happening every day, multiple times a day to massive groups of people, including children that they want to protect. But they're like, ah! It's like that clip from, I know it's from a show, but I see it on TikTok and it's like, mm, nah, what about the gays? What are we gonna do about them? That's what they wanted. They're like, queer people, let's focus on them um, and, and getting the, and get rid of them. We don't want them in print. We don't want them in media. We don't want them in real life. That's literally what they're saying. Even though you can have a private Christian school, you can have people get shot in church, a Christian church, and you still don't care about them. So who do you care about? We know the answer, no one but yourself and maybe your immediate family members, but maybe not. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but it's just, um, there's no words for how it makes me feel. And I often, I get really angry about it, but then sometimes I'm already down and it just feels like, what is the point? What is the point to keep going when I can't do anything to change anything? And I just have to sit here watching lives be destroyed day after day because of the selfishness and uh, the lack of humanity and care and empathy from the people running this country. So that was my rant. I'm so sorry, but it is, <sighs> there's just no words. Like what an unsafe place there's like nowhere you can go that you're guaranteed to be safe. You can't go to school, you can't go to church, the grocery store, um, movie theater, walking outside, a game, the beach, nowhere. And then they just wanna focus on taking access away from people, um, trying to demonize groups of people to say they're not people. Y'all don't need me to keep going. We all know, I just, this is so fucking stupid. Anyway, those were some of the things that I saw that I wanted to chat about today. Um, as always, I would love your thoughts down below. If you have any more like resources or anything to share related to one of the topics, um, share. But as always, keep it cute and respectful down there when you're having conversations. That's really the point of these videos is to spread awareness because I see a lot of things on Twitter. A lot of people don't have Twitter. So to spread spread awareness and to start a conversation. Um, but we wanna be we wanna be nice, okay? The world is is uh fucked up enough. Let's keep it cute in the comments. Anyway, thank you to Green Chef for sponsoring today's video. And um
actually which is perfect because I didn't know what I was gonna eat tonight and I have that in the freezer so I know what I'm gonna cook tonight now but anyway I love you all thank you so much for your constant support of me uh, give this video a thumbs up share subscribe Stay blessed, hydrated, moisturized, and sunscreen, and I'll see you in my next one. Bye.